Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man. Danny Houston. Yeah, man, it's going down. It's Danny Houston Podcast. I am Danny Houston. Check it out, man. We got a real special guest today, Brother Abdul Halim Muhammad. Dr. Abdul Halim Muhammad. Uh, he's a real, real special brother, man. He's been putting it down in the city of Houston for a long time, having his hands just in the community and just on everything that's good, working with, you know, what? many members of the Houston hip hop community. I actually connected with him through K Reno and I'm just honored, like I said, to have him here today uh in the studio, man. Doc, how you doing? How you I'm doing, well, Doc? You. I'm well, thank you, brother Donnie, and uh, I'm honored to be here with you. Uh, as I told you before, what kind of initiated this whole thing was in fact that I've been watching your shows and then you had Miss Charlotte on here. <laughs> Charlotte, shout out to Charlotte. And yeah. I learned so much about the city of Houston that I didn't know. So I've been here since 1980. So I just called K Reno, say, hey man, will you hear from that brother or you know that brother? Tell him how much I enjoyed his podcast and how much I learned about Houston from his show. And then I started looking at other one, little Kiki and others and even K Reno's interview and, and other interviews. And I was just, I said, wow, that's something and then of course, you extended the invitation, and I'm here, brother. I'm thankful, and it, it, it just tripped me out when K. Reno told me, and then I, I looked up, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I've seen this brother before get a, receive an award, because my mom, like I told you, she has a community outreach organization, and y'all received an award at the Power Center probably over 15 years ago. That was my first time seeing you. And so when I put everything together, I was just honored that someone who I consider to be of such prestige to be in what I'm doing, you know, so... I'm, I'm thankful, man. I appreciate you coming through, man. Well, you know, again, Brother Donnie, my teacher, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, we were in, this was the early 90s, and we were at the, uh, it was then the Doubletree, it's in Hilton now, over on, on Post Oak in the Galleria, and we were sitting with, with Quan L. X and Jay Prince, and he said to Jay, he said to Jay, he said, Brother, one of your rap songs will reach more of my people than all of my speeches put together. Hmm. Brother, I am a Farcom partisan. And of course, uh, you know, we had that summer, of what we would call our summer of soul, mind playing tricks on you. When you heard that, be, I mean, you just, that was the theme of that particular summer. And the beauty of it is, is that that's a song that went gold without video, without social media, as I've heard Jay Prince say, and it's absolutely true. But it was like our theme song and the Ghetto Boys broke out. Therefore, you know, there was East Coast, there's West Coast, and then there was the Gulf Coast or the Third Coast, which was us. But in that room, in the hotel suite, the minister told Jay, he said, one of your rap songs will reach more of my people than all my speeches put together. Now, mm -hmm. that, that floored me. But the truth of the matter is, is that hip hop, this genre, is indeed reaching people across the planet. So I've had the opportunity to travel to China, Turkey, different parts of Africa, the Caribbean, Central, Central America, and everywhere I went, I'm talking about in China, they're bumping hip hop music hmm. from our urban areas. So what you have is, is that you have literally the Pied Pipers of the world. And in some cases, it is, as Chuck D said, this is the CNN of our community and then there's those aspects of it where the, it is art that is imitating life and sometimes what we've got now is life imitating art mm. so you've got people who really had that experience in their lives and they're putting it well used to be on wax you can tell my age it used to be on wax but now they can have a studio in their home and, and do it and drop some tracks and go on Spotify one of those others but nonetheless they, uh, they are legitimate in terms of the struggle of their life, the family background, the abuse, the education, lack thereof, the experiences of violence, drugs, uh, and poverty. And then there are some who really are studio gangsters. And the prob that's, therein lies the problem where we're trying to portray ourselves as something that we're really not. And what happens is, is that when that song hits the street and it's it's hot it's getting a lot of plays or 
a lot of downloads. And then someone from the community says, okay, you know this cat? Yeah, man, I went to high school with him. We used to take his lunch money every mm. day. You know, and then, and then it, it all begins. So we, we have to look at it from the standpoint of that here's a message that's reaching literally the whole world. And because the man of God recognizes that, I have to assume, rightfully so, that Satan does too. Hmm. So what do you do? So we look at hip hop or look at this music, art and culture really is the start of a revolution. And our enemy realizes that. And we do have enemies, We're not each other. We've got a greater enemy. That being said, Brother Donnie, what you're looking at is a situation where me, I'm stuck. I'm frozen in the 70s. Forgive me, brother. I'm frozen in the 70s. But coming up in the 60s and 70s, I grew up in New York. Growing up there, you listen to the radio, and the AM radio stations were literally the drums of our community. So, of course, we had the Supremes and the Stylistics and the Delphonics and, and the Four Tops and Marvin Gaye and others. But you would, there, was a, there was a balance of love songs and some silly songs, maybe Rufus Thomas, you know, uh, Do the Funky Chicken mm -hmm. or Walking the Dog or something along that line. But then you had Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, maybe early 70s, going into the 60s. You had James Brown, him having a certain, certain kind of consciousness, you know, talking about funky president. You know, he said, let's get together and buy some land, raise our food just like the man. He said, do, uh, save our money, do like the mob, put up a factory and own the job, mm. you know. So he, he would talk about that. And then that was like funky president. And of course, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. You know, I worked on jobs, my feet, my hand, but all the work I did was for the other man. Mm. You know, but we decided to do things for ourselves. We're tired of beating our heads up against the wall and work for someone else. So you got that theme beating in our head. And then you've got the Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, wake up everybody, no more sleeping in bed, no more backwards thinking, time for thinking ahead. You've got that kind of consciousness. And of course, you've got the love songs where Marvin Gaye went from let, uh, from uh, what's going on to let's, let's get, get it on. on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so you had that. And you even had that among the Supremes or Four Tops. And they may not have been, they may have been the B side of a 45. And maybe the other hit was, you know, was, was something, but there was something conscious on there. So the point, the point that, I'm, uh, that, that really that the minister made took a long time for it to sink into my head, to be honest with you. And, you know, we are charged, the Nation of Islam, we are charged with delivering the word to the people. That's why you see the brothers with the paper out there. It's not that they're paper boys, brother. We're like messengers. And we're delivering this message to our people. We are obligated to tell our people what's going on. Now, whether they accept or reject it, that's on them. But we're obligated to tell them. And if we don't, then their blood is required of our hands. Mm -hmm. So that being said, for a while, it took me a while to sink in on that. I'm saying, man, do you, my favorite Ghetto Boy song really isn't my mind playing tricks on me. I know Willie D and them. And, and that's Starface. not my favorite Ghetto Boy song either. But, yeah. My, but my favorite Ghetto Boy song is Damn It Feels Good to Be a Gangster. Oh, okay. <laughs> where, where, where Jay comes on at the end. Yeah. Damn and he's talking, about, yeah. he's talking about Bush. You know, he, he makes it political. And so that was really one of my favorite Ghetto Boy songs. Now, Mind Playing Tricks on is right there, though. You know, but that song there was had a statement, made a statement. You know, and Scarface and Willie D and, 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 and Bush, they're talking about, you know, what this is what a real gangster does, you know, especially the, the non-radio version, you mm -hmm, know, when you mm -hmm. listen to it. So when you think about all of that, brother, and I, fast, and I kind of fast forward to like around 1999, and at a certain point, you know, my conscience began just eating away at me because in truth, I've seen a whole lot of what I call T-shirt pornography, so-and-so, rest in peace. Mm with angel wings and all that. So who, who, we gonna, who else are we going to lose? Hmm. How many of are lost to us? So I called a meeting at uh, the mosque. And at the meeting, and I, I wish I had Kay Reno and them here so they, because there's some of the names I don't remember, but I know 3-2 was there. That was my cousin. Did I take, we ever talked about that? 3-2 yeah, was yeah. at this meeting at my mosque, at the mosque, <laughs> in the conference room. Yeah, 3-2. Um, Trey. Was there Trader Truth? He was there. K Reno, of course. Murder One, Ronnie Thomas, um, and it may have been a few. Oh, 
DJ Screw. Oh, wow. And, and uh, South Park Mexican, Carlos, South Park Mexican. They were at this meeting I hell. Now, I'm not, you know, and, and I'm not knocking my Christian brothers. You know, I, there are many of them great pastors in the city, but some are like Reverend Kasichek, hmm. you know, and they will come and talk to the rappers and say, yeah, y'all need to do all this and give me some money. That's not my style. I was talking to them about owning their publishing rights, their masters, don't sign these three six. Wait, contracts. wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait, wait. How do you even acquire? Because from my, unless we finna talk about it later, I don't know you to be a music guy, but to have that knowledge and knowing like that's what a power lies. How are you even getting into that? Is it was this like what you're learning through the, through Jay and seeing what he's doing with rap a lot and all that? Is that how you kind of learning the talks of that, or is this something that you kind of yeah, been just into? something that you you learn, you pick up along the way of do's and don'ts, hmm. and in particular. If you think about it, of course, coming out of the 60s and 70s, when you think about, for instance, Michael Jackson getting uh, Little Rich's masters and giving them back to him, what do you mean he didn't own his own masters? Or how many of our blues people, Lightning Hopkins and all of them, and these other ones that were jazz coming out, uh, 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 Blue Note Records or, 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 or these other chess records, or all of these, right, having uh, blues or jazz genre, and really all the artists wanted to do was be accepted, get applause, get a little money, this, that, and the other. But they died broke. They're taken advantage of, yeah. They were taken yeah. advantage of. Yeah. So, you know, you think about Red Fox and all these people who, who died owing money. Or even think about, go back to far as Joe Lewis, the boxer. Here's a man that he went into the army. He did everything they wanted him to do. He, he, he did exhibitions. He raised money for, for war bonds and all that. And yet they couldn't forgive him his taxes. And he wound up being a, a, a greeter at Caesar's Palace. So many of our artists, many of our cultural treasures have literally died broke. And the people who couldn't dance, couldn't sing, they couldn't do anything. They and their children went to Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and Stanford and all of these places, and they're living large and they're going on. We talk about these people, but you, for instance, if I use somebody's music in a commercial, I got to get royalty rights, not from them or their family or their heirs. I've got to get the royalty rights from the people who really own it now. So my discussion with those who were there at that meeting was for them to own their publishing rights to you know make sure they put their name you know on the on the song by so and so they, to make sure that they uh, uh, kept their masters to make sure that um, you know that they didn't sign away their their life or their, their image or their name that was the things with, with Prince you know how did he become the artist uh, you know formerly known as Prince and have when he went to the, the Grammys, With I think slave he have on slave it. on his face because he was saying to them, look, man, you own my name. You own my image because I signed this contract. What I love about, for instance, Master P, because I have a radio, I have a radio show, Connect the Dots on KPFT comes on on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. But at one time I interviewed Master P. And. I'm, I'm looking at Master P and he's giving an interview. I'm watching it on the Internet, though, just a little later. And he talked about how he went to the music executives and they offered him a million dollars. He looked at it, he read the contract, and, and he said, no, that's okay. And he said, while he was on the plane, I don't know whether his, bro his relative. His brother, yeah, he had no money. He was yeah, wondering why he, said, he didn't man, take the man, money. We got, man, we grew up in the projects, man. You know, what's, a million dollars, bro. He said, if they offered us a million, how much are we really worth to them? And Master P took it from there. So... So you, you have now, though, this struggle between a kind of conscious rap. It's street conscious and just people that are just saying it's just nonsense. OK. And unfortunately, when you sell your soul to the devil, one day the bill comes due. Mm. So we have many people who are given a million dollars or two million dollars or five million dollars. To really, because they listened at the demo tape, they listened to him, and they heard some consciousness in there, and they bought that, they paid him or her that money to put that on the shelf, because we don't, we don't want to hear that. And if you really go back to the, the initial, uh, let's talk about East, East Coast hip-hop, 
again, coming out of the 60s and 70s, it was a struggle, the civil rights struggle. And by the time they passed the, the 64, you had the, you had the Nation of Islam, you had the assassination of Malcolm X, you had the assassination of, of, of John F. Kennedy, you had the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, Dr. King was assassinated, then you had the Fair Housing Act, so we, and then you had the Panther Party, you had the Nation of, you had all of these groups, organizations, SCLC, all these come along, Black Liberation Army, and then we just got exhausted. So then what we got was, in turn, we got disco. Hmm. So you think about Last it. Last time to party, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a private party. <laughs> do, do, do. Yeah, you know, it's a private party. So you, you saw that, and it's like, yeah, okay, you know, good times. These are hmm. the good times. You know, leave your cares behind. That's a theme because we were tired, right? And so we got tired of the struggle. So what we did was we had disco. So we got disconnected, we got mm. disinterested, and we got discombobulated. And so you look at hip hop, you look at the, uh, really it's the West Bronx, not the South Bronx that came out, the West Bronx, and, and you think about, I think it's Cool Herc it was that started doing beats in his house. He's a Jamaican, mm -hmm. he has Jamaican background, he started doing beats in his house. But if you look at the, the essence of hip hop in its, its, its initial phase, you had them taking their parents' albums from the 60s and 70s and Funky Drummer and others and cutting them up, right? And then, and then you had the MC rapping over them. And then you put some linoleum on the, on the school park uh, grounds, basketball court, and you had the break dancers break it dancing. And then because in the, United, in the New York school system, they were so broke, <laughs> New York was, was literally bankrupt under Ed Koch and others. To the, 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 the school system is not like here, we have an independent school system. Chicago, New York are tied to the, the mayor's office or to City Hall. Hmm. So when they had budget crisis, they would cut out what they thought was non-essential, such as arts and culture and dance and all that. So what did our brothers do? Graffiti. Our brothers used the subway car as their canvas. So you had, you had your, your DJ scratching, your MCs rapping, your break dancers break, breaking, and you had your graffiti writers writing. And then later, as it evolved, especially here, you got slab, and I really love what little Kiki was saying about slab, because I'm thinking slab, slow, loud, and banging. You know, I'm thinking that's later that. on. That's later on. That's yeah. later on. But the truth of the matter is, is, is that's later on. But he really was talking about, you know, the slab, the cement, the slab. I said, wow, that was deep. Yeah. And I loved that interview that you did with him. And I, again, once again, I learned, I learned so much. So the, these things, and I'm talking about how I, I acquired this knowledge, it comes over time, it's experience, it's seeing that, you know, we started off, we had millions of acres of land at the turn of last century, now we're, we're losing so much land, we're almost a landless people. So if you don't have land, which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan teaches is the basis of independence, then what? treasures do we have if we mm. don't have gold if we don't have diamond if we don't have oil if we don't have platinum if we don't have palladium we don't have these precious metals what we have is our art and culture community and so when you look at the grammys when you look at the when you look at the oscars when you look at uh even uh the stage play awards that they give you see us so we are treasure you would not have the cuisine that we have, hmm. if it weren't for us being enslaved, you wouldn't have jazz as a genre. You wouldn't have hip hop as a genre if it weren't for that. You wouldn't have gospel or spirituals if it weren't for that. It is really, as Minister Farrakhan has taught us, out of our pain comes creativity. And so, you know, uh, the song Precious Lord, Take mm -hmm, My Hand, mm -hmm. Lead Me On, that comes from a brother who went on a sink, he went to, I think it's St. Louis, to, to, to do a concert. His wife was pregnant. She gave birth, but she died in childbirth. Then later on, the infant died. So the singer and the writer of that song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, it came from that pain. So our Negro spirituals, swing low, sweet chariot, come, for, come from our pain. Go down Moses and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Come from our pain, you know? 
I got shoes, you got shoes, all of God's children got shoes. When mm. I get to heaven, I'm going to wear my shoes, I'm going to walk all over God's heaven. That comes from our pain. And if you look at it, the spirituals, the gospel, our R&B, our rhythm and blues, our blues. Dun, 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 dun. She left me now. Mm. Dun, 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 dun. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it comes from my pain, but from that pain comes this great creativity. And so it is with hip hop. It came out of our pain. And if you look at this initial, when you look at your ex clan, when you look at Big Daddy Kane, when you look at uh, uh, all of these rappers, many of them out of Brooklyn, 5%, Nation of Islam influence in it, at a certain point in time, remember any new genre that comes out, beloved brother Donnie, what happens is that the enemy first, he mocks it. Mm. And we've got disco, we got Studio 54 over here, we got everybody coming here. We got Mick Jagger, we got <laughs> Bianca Jagger, we got Michael Jackson, we got everybody coming over here, Studio 54. Them cats was making so much money, man, that when the IRS busted them, they went up in the ceiling and found all they cash. <laughs> you know, but, but the run that they had, based upon disco, was huge. So they looking at these street people, hey, what is this, this hippie, Bad, yeah. this, this, this hippie, yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they realized that an underground was starting. And these children were listening to that and turning off this, but listening to that. And at a certain point in time, once they mock you, then sometimes they try to destroy you. But then after that time, they join you. Hmm. And so we got joined. And so when you look at it, beloved, the unfortunate thing about it is, is that every ethnic group that's ever come to America has a criminal element. We're the only ones that our criminal element has not been allowed to clean up its money and become legitimate. Mm. So you think about it, the one that owns Seagram's liquor and then eventually went into music, the Brofman family, right? The man was, the, Sam Brofman, the grandfather, was a bootlegger. And they were bringing liquor back and forth from Canada into America. And there's a gang called the Purple Gang in Detroit <laughs> that you know, basically control the, the liquor, the alcohol, the gambling, and all of that, and different ones. So you had the Italian, Italian, Sicilians, you had all of that, which is kind of played out in The Godfather. The names and faces were changed, you know, not to protect the innocent, <laughs> but, you know, to protect the guilty, really. Hmm. So every ethnic group has this criminal element to them, but they clean up their money, and next thing you know, their, their, their sons or their grandsons, the head of a foundation, or they do this, that, and the other. But us, you talk about Bumpy Johnson, the Godfather Harlem, you talk about Nicky Barnes, you talk about any of these, these cats that we see, or when Vin Rames was doing uh, American Gangster and he was doing all the narratives, the Chambers mm -hmm. Brothers and all of these cats. Look, Rayford Edwards up there in, in D.C. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm surprised they do one on Johnny Binder. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm surprised. I was they, I was waiting like y'all got it. Yeah, gotta, yeah gotta, you got you got to do Brother Johnny and 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 I owe Brother Johnny a debt of gratitude. Believe it or not, when he went to prison, federal prison, he heard the minister on the radio. And he said, "Who is this? <laughs> Who is this cat?" <laughs> and he sent for me. And I came up to Bastrop, I think it was Bastrop, right out of Austin, to speak to the brothers. And everywhere Johnny Binder went in the prison, he sent, he sent for me and made the chaplain bring me up so I could service the brothers in the nation of Islam. Mm. Because I was locked out of the state prison here. Because of the change in the leadership of the nation of Islam, those who were volunteers, those who went in under the nation of Islam, and when there was a change and we were, they were more orthodox, they became the chaplains. So we were locked out. So I wasn't allowed for years. I've been a minister since 1987 here in this city. And I, was, I wasn't allowed in the state prisons. So I went to the federal circuit. Hmm. So, so I've been from everything from, from uh, club fed, from the low, all the way up to the penitentiary like Lewisburg. Some of the, and the only, only level I have not been on is the Supermax. I think they got Supermax in Colorado where they have the people down in the ground and they got these terrorists and all that. But I've traveled across this country going to the federal, the, in the federal prisons. And so I owe Brother Johnny that and I am always have gratitude because it's not about I, me, and mine. It's about us, our, and we. Hmm. And you should never forget the people who have brought you, brought you across. So I, I'm grateful uh, to that aspect. And there are so many people that I've met and influenced 
there in uh, in that federal system. But I, again, uh, I digress. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so cliche, cliche just came in here. What's going on, cliche? <laughs> okay, so so tell me this because this is it's so cool talking to you and like all the things you're telling me about like you've lived through the Malcolm X the Martin Luther King the JFK you've lived through all these things and usually you know y'all's generation kind of shunned hip hop a little bit were you to the place you at now from the jump or did you have to kind of come around to no no I, I loved hip hop I had an aunt brother <laughs> that loved the rapper's delight so ain't no way I could just I could just Say I didn't like it. I I I liked it because you know they sample good times. So I'm coming it's out. It's already familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are, and so you know. Dun, 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 dun. You know the hip, the hop, the, the hip, hip, the hip, the hip, 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 hop. You know. So it's not like I couldn't love it. And then of course I'm influenced. I'm Curtis Blow, and I and I tell you a secret, brother. I used to like DJ. What? But it, it makes sense though. It makes sense because we, you, I could, you, you're really, really passionate about this music. I can tell you're not just giving me this because I'm a music guy. Like I know this is in you. So, no, I'm not surprised that you were a DJ. It's a trip, so, but yeah. So, so all of this, you know. So of course, it, and I used to do Christmas parties, and uh, wait, what you, what you playing when you DJing? When I, when I play, I play, I play. Usually, somebody come up to me about about 11.30 after about three, four drinks, they say, me, you got some loofah? Play some loofah for me. Ooh. Still in love wait, with wait, me. Wait, 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 wait. This is in the 80s you DJing. Sure. Early, so you were, early 80s. But you came to the nation. I came to the nation. Okay, so you want my story? I'll give you my story. That's why I was getting ready to go to like what right. brought you to the actual, you know. So, so let me finish the point about the influence of music, of rap. So, of course, I love Curtis Blow. You know, and Christmas is one thing I know. So every year about this time, I, I celebrate it with a rhyme, rhyme yeah. you know. <laughs> so that kind of, so you got that. And uh, But my background is, is like this, beloved. Growing up in New York, right, and I lived in what is called Washington Heights. Washington Heights was the headquarters of George Washington during the Battle of Harlem, during the Revolutionary War. It is, and it's adjacent to what is called Sugar Hill, where all the high society black people lived, right? But all of my family lived in Harlem, right? And, the, and Washington Heights looks over the polo grounds where the Rucker tournament is played. But the polo grounds was actually, when, when my family moved there, the polo grounds was actually the place where the New York Mets and the New York Giants played. So I could go up on my roof and look and down into the, the stadium, but they were like ants, so you really <laughs> couldn't tell, man. But... Everything that I learned, I learned to swim at the Harlem Y on 135th Street. My grandmother lived on 117th Street and 7th Avenue, which is now called Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. Around the corner from there on 116th Street and Lenox Avenue, which is now Malcolm X Boulevard, is Moss or Temple Number 7. So my grandmother, I was born on her birthday. And I, 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 my grandmother's next to, to God and the minister and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and, and uh, my grandmother and my own mother. My grandmother is my heart. Hmm. So I would go visit her and sometimes we'd go shopping. So there was no Walmart, Super Walmart, Super Target and all of that. We would go from store to store to store up and down 116th Street. It was like little bodegas to, yeah, and stuff like that. Just yeah. bodegas and, and, and whatnot to get it. Nobody ever robbed them. Nobody ever bothered them because those brothers was on the corner with that newspaper, that Muhammad Speaks newspaper, mm. selling that newspaper. And them stern brothers, I was looking at them. I was a little scared of them now. They were stern face, brother, you know, selling that paper. And then, you know, there was a delicacy that we ate bean pies and carrot cakes. And then you go to the steak and take and you'd have the steak sandwiches or you'd have the fish sandwiches and whatnot. So the, the influence was there. And then there were basically two stations you picked from on AM if you wanted to hear music. It was WWRL, 1600 AM, and it was WABC. WABC had Bruce Morrow and I think Murray Decay and other cats like that. But you, you had on uh, WWRL, uh, you had the, the Frankie Crocker and those kind of uh, DJs that would come on there. 
and Minister Farrakhan would come on there. You would hear Reverend Ike on that station on Sunday, mm. you know. So, but the influence of the of the Muslims was always there. And then, of course, uh, where I would go play basketball on 173rd Street going uptown, I, you'd pass by the Audubon Ballroom where Malcolm X was assassinated. And when I broke my, on my wrist uh, at, at day camp, matter of fact, the, at, at the YMCA, where I got my wrist set is the same hospital, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, where Malcolm X was taken after he was shot. And where I got my first pair of braces was there. So all of that is a, is a kind of like it soaks into your DNA. And for me... But th but these are just influences. You're not going to the mosque and y'all yeah. not doing it. This is just what's around. This is just, you see that. Mm -hmm. So when you love somebody, like I love my grandmother, and then at a certain point in time when the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad departed, 1975, and there was a change of leadership in the nation, they moved Minister Farrakhan out of there. They kind of disbanded and changed the, 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 the fruit of Islam, the brothers. They changed that. I can mark that time my grandmother got beat and robbed, and we had to move her out of New York and move her down to New Jersey, where eventually my mother even took me because I was starting to get in trouble. So I finished school in a place called Whitesboro, New Jersey. It's named after George White, which was the last post-Reconstruction congressman out of Wilmington, North Carolina, where my, my ancestral roots are from there. And that's a whole nother story. I get people here laughing about Wilmington, North Carolina, if I tell you about the Wilmington Massacre of 1898, where my <laughs> great-grandparents were literally terrorized. You think about, you think about Rosewood, mm -hmm. you think about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. There was a coup d'etat that took place in Wilmington, North Carolina in November of 1898, where they overthrew the municipal government. And so I can trace through Ancestry.com my family to that point, and then they're scattered to the four winds after that. I can't, I can't, I'm f having a hard time finding them. So I Wait, 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 but you said you were getting, because I don't want to, you said you started getting in trouble in high school, though. Yeah, in my ninth grade of high school, yeah. So, okay, what kind of trouble are we talking about? Like, what you... Drugs. My, selling drugs, or, or on a drug, using side? Drugs, I, you know, drugs, partying, drinking, Boone Farm apple wine, smoking weed. In ninth grade? In ninth grade, snorting heroin. No shit. Yeah. You just okay. You just ninth okay, grade. You just threw the whole interview oh, yeah, in the it direction. Was, it was and and really, what I, I realized was, I came home. You know, <laughs> you remember the old Richard Pryor joke where he said, "What's the clock say?" What's the clock? You don't remember that? Okay, okay. a little bit before your time. But Richard Pryor had this joke where he talked about, he tell you what time to be in. What's the clock say? My mama told me being at eleven o'clock. Hmm. I came in at midnight. I walked through the door. She was there with the belt. She started wailing on my backside, brother, and I didn't move. I just looked at her. I was about 13. And I, she said, what the, what's wrong with you? And I asked her, where's my father? See, I grew up in a single parent household. Me too. Me and my brother and my sisters. Uh -huh. But my two best friends, though their mothers and fathers were divorced, they would see them at Father's Day. They would come to baseball games and different things yeah, like you that. So you, you understand but the difference. But me, no. I seen, you know, I had godfathers, you know. <laughs> My mother was a lover. God bless her soul. <laughs> but I had godfathers. <sighs> and I, one day I just said, where's my father? And it took me to literally, I'm a grown man, to realize the look that was on her face. It was terror. I come to learn later that my mother was a victim of domestic violence and wanted nothing to do with my father. So they divorced when I was an infant. But that anger was in me. So up until that point, you never really opened that up, that conversation up about my No, that. up to that point. I, I kind of wondered, because she gave me actually her first husband's last name. I had four names. I wonder what the hell I got four names? I said, my brother and my sister, they ain't, they ain't got no four names. I got four names. Why well, I got four names? And I finally realized she put that on there so I wouldn't think I was different than them, except for I did have uh, two middle names. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, beloved, you know, at that point, so at that point, my mother realized I need to get him out of this environment. So she sent me down to Whitesboro, New Jersey, which is the tip, Cape May County, New Jersey. Brother, there's no place in East Texas or East or Western Louisiana, brother, that's more that's as country as that place hmm. is, brother. That's why they call it the Garden State for real. 
but growing up there, I finished high school there. Then I went, I went away to college in Virginia. Did you, did, you, did you change your ways in between that? Like with the streets and the well, drugs and well, all that? No, or, I, or are you just I, making it? No, I just, it wasn't, it, I didn't have the access to, to the things I had in New York. New York, you could find it anywhere, you know, anywhere you want to. There you had to kind of work at it because it was sort of country and whatnot. And South Jersey is under the influence of Philadelphia. North Jersey is under the influence of New York, that New York media market. So that being said, you know, I graduated high school, and I remember taking my college papers to my school counselor. I said, Ms. Delaney needed to fill out these college papers. She said, oh, Bob, my name was Robert. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob, you're not really college material. Go down to room A1 and see the Marine recruiter. What? It was still Vietnam was still going on at the time. I said, well, you know, Ms. Delaney, it's not a matter whether I'm going to college or not. It's only a matter where I'm going to college. I said, you... You want to fill out these papers. You don't want my mama to come up here. Hmm. She filled out those papers. The day I graduated high school, I got my acceptance letter from Hampton Institute at that time, Hampton University. And I finished there in four years. You know, I wasn't no valedictorian for sure. But you made it through. But I made you're it supposed through. to make it through, yeah. I made it through. So a lot of times what happens, beloved, is, is that our children, they see genius in them. Because there's all kind of leaders in school. There are those who are the sports leaders. There's the one who's Mr. and Miss Popularity. There's the ones who are really the scholars. There's the ones who's the gang members. You know, they in school, they just in school because, hell, man, that's the place I can get me some lunch and, and you know, and I can hang out and I'm not going to jail because my, my, my probation officer said I need to go to school, you know. So you got different kind of leaders in the, in the school. So, so I was one of them that was kind of popular. I played football. I wasn't great. I wasn't going to go there no scholarship. But I was kind of popular, but she never guided me in the time that I was there from 10th grade to 12th grade to say, you know, Bob, you need to take algebra two. You need to take chemistry. You need to take physics. You need to take all of these other classes. So what I did on my own was I took a lot of history inventory and English inventory. And that basically is why I went and got a liberal arts degree. Hmm. So... My thing is, you can hear me rattling off history. My thing is, I have, a, I have this deep, passionate love for history and public policy. So my master's and my PhD is in urban planning and environmental policy. So I, so I, I, I have that kind of mindset. But when you pull it all together, brother, it's, it's about people. It's about people. And so this is, this is why I have such a love for the hip hop community and they don't need leadership they just need guidance hmm. so I don't treat them like they're less than me I sit and I marvel at when I see God come out of them you know when I see the evolution of K Reno from, from where he was because some of his stuff was real street <laughs> when he was young to now it's still street but it's on a whole nother level and I understand why in many cases, he can't be on some people's albums. They could be on his, but he can't be on theirs for certain reasons. There's a reason why. With the great concert they had in his soul, he's just a wonderful soul and so humble that he, he claps it up for, for, our, for the hip-hop genre to, to have that Friday at the rodeo with Bun and all them, man. I mean, that. but if you think about it, I think about rap a lot. Then I think about SBC, South Park Coalition. I think about Screwed Up Click. I think I think about Swisher Heights Records and all of that. I think about those That's our foundation. All the all those foundation here in Houston. So somebody from SBC, somebody K Reno, somebody should have been there. But if he wasn't, then I understand. I'm not I'm not angry because some people are actually they don't sell out. They're pulled out. And then they say, this is, this is our favorite one. Okay, good. So we can't suffer from envy and jealousy. We must understand and recognize that when we don't control the venues, when we don't control the money, when we don't control the media, right, we have to have an agenda. What our problem is, even if we have a black mayor, a black governor, a black president, if we don't have an unapologetically black agenda, 
like everyone else does. The insurance companies, the record industry, the telecommunications industry, the oil and gas industry, they have an unapologetically fill-in-the-blank agenda. Do we have that? Tell me the five things that black people say. So everybody calls you and said, Minister, I want you to endorse my candidacy. I said, you haven't heard my agenda. Hmm. See, I got five things that I want you to do if I'm going to endorse you. And also, really, I'm, I'm not in the mood for endorsing politicians in terms of endorsing them in their primaries and all of that. Because if they repudiate my minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, or me, after we put our life on the line for them, man, I'm through with them Speak at the that face, point. Yeah. Yeah. So the minister's forgiving. I, <laughs> I'm his student, so I have to learn to be Halim. Halim is forbearing. And I'm trying to grow into that. He is like that. Brother, people have done things to the minister that I, I just can't believe. It, just, it, turns a, it turns a knot in my stomach. But I have to learn that there's something bigger going on. So even when there are things where I disagree with Mayor Turner on, I'm very careful how I critique and criticize him because we have a bigger enemy than him. And I say to all our politicians and for our young people, politics has its role, a role. It's not the role. That's the problem. The problem is, as the Honorable Louis Farrakhan has taught us, brother, is that politics without economics is symbol without substance. Hmm. So we got it bass backwards. In other <laughs> words, politics is really to guard your economics. Because there were 56 white male property owners that signed the Declaration of Independence. There were 39 white male property owners that signed the Constitution of the United States on September 17, you know, 1787, brother. These were property owners. They own land and they own people. Yeah. Us. Yeah. Yeah. So property and guarding property what was the revolution about? Taxation without representation is tyranny. Why? Because the colonists were angry because the French Indian War, the Seven Year War, took place where they were protecting the colonies against the French and the Indians that were aligned with them. And so the British Parliament said, we got to pay for that war. So they taxed the colonies, but they didn't have anybody from the colonies there in the Parliament to say, hey, well, that's too much. Don't tax my tea. Don't tax my stamps. What are you doing over here? So they rebelled. And the hotbed of that rebellion was in Massachusetts with your Samuel Adams and your Paul Revere's and others like that. And that was the creation of, of the revolution. So we got to be clear that we, this thing is about land. It's about ownership. So that's what I talked to him about in that meeting, mm. 1999. I said, go and buy up your community. Now, I look at Brother Trey and... I said, man, all praise is due to Allah, the things that he's doing. I look at what Slim Thug is doing up in, in Acres Homes. I say, all praise is due to Allah. But we formed a group later on called Artists Respecting Community. It really was a tribute to Wicked Cricket hmm. before he passed. He was like, to us, giving his last testimony. We would sit him in the mosque and he would come and he would literally tell us, what was on his heart, sometimes his bitterness at not getting the, the kind of uh, props that he should have gotten because he gave a lot of people starts, man, in radio and his little television show and all that kind of stuff, man. And, and what really hurt us was the fact that when he passed, there was jokers having all kind of fundraisers, we're gonna help his family. And let me tell you, brother, we went to his graveside off of Cullen over there. What, that's not paradise. That's, what is that grave? Memorial. Memorial, yeah. Memorial Gardens. Memorial Gardens. And we went there. He didn't have a headstone. So all these people so called raising money for, for, for Wicked Cricket and he didn't have a headstone. So the artists respect the community. Hmm. We raised the money. I went with me and Kay Reno, went to the people and said, okay, how much is a headstone? They gave us them and they messed it up a couple times. I said, no, no, no. Get that right. Get it right. Because you're going to carve this in stone. We got it. We got the price for it. And the artists raised the money. 
And we went there, we paid for his headstone. I brought back the receipt to them because I'm not Reverend Kasichek. I don't want their money. Mm -hmm. I just want to be able to guide them to something better. Make your money, do what you got to do, party, rap, do all that. But you got to contribute to the liberation of our people because you are the leaders. Mm -hmm. See the people you have sitting on this couch? They are the leaders. But without guidance, where are they leading the people? Now, there are people that have sat on your couch, I know, have heard the minister, visited the minister, or been touched by the minister directly or indirectly. They don't have to be Muslim. You know, they may smoke, they may drink, they may eat pork, they may do that and other. This ain't about conversion, brother. This is about us having a, a vision to where we got to go as a people. And... We have to come to the point where we understand that what's good for black people is good for humanity. Hmm. See, there are people who love black culture, but they don't love black people. And, and, and that's what bothers me. Where these, these suburban people who really buy a lot of the hip hop music, you know, and use the N word and, and all of that. But they can have youthful indiscretions. But let little Kiki make a mistake and he got to go on the assumed name for 10 years. Well, that was an interesting story. Bro. I can't, that was, bro, I love that interview, brother. But I admire that brother, man. I was listening to him, man. I, just, I was tuning in. I was zoning in on that piece. But let them make mistakes. Or let them rise to fame. Minister Farrakhan says to us that, you know, the higher up you get, Satan is there too. Hmm. So you get up high, you make a mistake. You do a Will Smith's thing something happened i was just getting ready to ask you how you felt about that because i think a 10-year ban is a stretch this is will smith the man track record is immaculate well one mistake 10-year ban that's crazy that's how they are see that that's that's my point donnie my point is is that when jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert one of the things he did when he finished that fast he was met by satan satan took him up on a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the power thereof. And he said, I'll give you this if you bow down and worship me. Mm. So they know our desires. They know what we like. You like women? You like boys? You like little girls? You like dope? What do you like? What do you want? You like jewelry? You like cars? I got it. Because I, that's, this is my world. So whatever you want by your desires, they'll offer it to you. And they'll make you an offer you can't refuse. But what you got to do is you got to give me your soul. Hmm. And if you mess up, I will bring back all of that stuff that you did. I will, all of a sudden now you'll see your mugshot on the internet. Deshaun Watson. Oh, Deshaun Watson. You know. That, 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 what you're saying, it just brings me to that place of like. Brother, they knew. They knew that brother was, was getting these massages. Let me just leave it at that. Because they say they were masseuses. But if we start digging, if we start digging into these masseuses, we might find out something. Because they got to be deposed too. And when we start digging into these masseuses, I'm not saying all of them are innocent or, 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 or something didn't happen. I, I wasn't there. But when you start, there's always two sides, to, really three sides to the story. There's his side, their and side, the and truth. the truth. And, and we must come to understand the value of a woman. So on another side of that thing, I'm saying 22 these sisters or these women are saying you did something to them, brother. So we must understand the value of the woman. Nation of Islam, our theology is a nation can rise no higher than this woman. Hmm. The woman must be honored, respected, and protected, for she is the mother of civilization. That is our theology. That the key to understanding the kingdom of God is to understand the woman. Once you understand the woman, because there's nobody that comes to this earth, Jesus, Muhammad, Moses, you name it, Martin Luther King, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Farrakhan, me, you, or anybody that doesn't come through the womb of a woman. She is special. She is a divine second self of God himself. That's our theology. So, if you disrespecting women, 
you don't understand what you're doing. You put you you can't claim Jesus or Muhammad or Allah on one sense and be disrespected a woman, and don't repent for it. Hmm. So it's one thing to say, you know something, I, I need to apologize. You must have mistook what I did, or what I did was I crossed the line. It wasn't criminal because they said it wasn't criminal, but he might have to be he might have to write some checks. And then he has to repent within his own self. He know what he did or he didn't do. I don't know. The women know what they came there for, masseuse or whatever. And then now here's a chance. And then you think about the Texans. He said, I don't want to play for you no more. Now all of a sudden this stuff happened. Look, man. Carmelo, it's not a coincidence at all. Yeah, Car yeah, Carmelo Anthony did an interview one time that he was talking about. He was he, he from the streets. So he's hanging out with his homeboys and whatnot. And uh, he got a call from the, the head of uh, the, the NBA committee. He said, look at man. <laughs> Do you want to be a ball player or you, you want to be in the streets? And then the, cat, the, the, the head of the commissioner ran down everything that they knew about him. Because, see, they hire ex-FBI agents. They do background checks on you. If I'm going to give you multi-million dollar contract, I know everything about you. This is the first time I've ever heard this. This is for real. Man, please. They know everything about They know everything about us, brother. Let me give advice on this show because maybe they will, maybe the hip-hop community will watch me. There are three things you got to know about the FBI. One, never talk to them unless you got your lawyer. Don't answer a question. Let them give you a subpoena. Let them arrest you. Let them give you their card. But do not talk to them. Two, if you do talk to them with your lawyer, do not lie to them. Because every question they ask you, they already know the answer. Mm. And if you, in asking you that question, they're trying to confirm what they already know or tie in something else that they know and see if you can, if you can uh, Connect help that's for them. give strength to it. But if you lie to them, they'll charge you with lying to them. Mm. And the last thing I'll say, number three, is follow number one and number two. <laughs> we've had the, we've had that situation here in Houston, brother. When I became the minister of the mosque, 1987, 1989, the FBI came to one of the brothers that were in the mosque and started questioning him about a brother that had been killed back in the early 80s before I ever joined the mosque. And the brother was getting ready to answer the questions, but he was on the phone with our captain, brother Khalil Muhammad, who was my captain for 17 years and. And again, that's another one of those bridges you don't want to forget that helped get me where I am. So it's no, no I, me, and mine. I, they're wind beneath my wings, brother. And he told him, no, don't answer no questions. I'm on my way. He went over there and he told the FBI, he's he not answering your questions. He said, well, why not? He said, I'm his captain. Hmm. He said, we got, a, we got a hierarchy. You got one. He's not answering your questions. It turned out that the FBI was here based upon some interviews they did in other cities, right? where they thought that the minister or other laborers that were in the nation that came down here to find out about this, this killing of this, of this brother, that they had tapes. They had taped the meeting. So what the FBI did in an attempt to destroy Minister Farrakhan, there was a squad called Squad 5A that they assigned to destroy Minister Farrakhan in the early, in the early 80s, the mid to late 80s. They came here questioning people and what they did was, eventually, subpoenas were sent out for a grand jury. Hmm. They subpoenaed Khalid Muhammad. They subpoenaed Jabril Muhammad. And they subpoenaed uh, Leonard, uh, Leonard Muhammad, Leonard Farrakhan. No, no, no. No. They subpoenaed Minister Farrakhan. Why? They want to get him in front of a grand jury. So, the late, great Lewis Myers Jr., who went to Wheatley High School, Khalid Muhammad, went to Wheatley High School. Many great ones went to Wheatley High School back in the day when it was them and Booker T. Washington. Anyway, I digress. We went into court, Judge Mary Bacon's courtroom, criminal courtroom, to quash the subpoena. And Lou Myers got up and argued in open court that it was Squad 5A that was going around the country trying to gather evidence to get Mr. Farcon in front of a grand jury. She denied the motion to quash the subpoena, but Mr. Farquhar never came before that grand jury. But outside the courtroom, he argued so strong. But outside the courtroom, the assistant district attorney said to, uh, said to us, I, to my own eyes, he said, he said, well, we didn't want to do this. It was the FBI, 
asked us to do it. You got to understand what you're dealing with. And if the FBI don't get you, the IRS will. Hmm. So if you're making money, make sure that you have somebody that's a good bean counter can take you. You can either get a good lawyer and a good accountant. To all, I say to all of them, good lawyer and a good accountant. Because the IRS's approach is that you're guilty to proven innocent. They'll freeze all your stuff and now prove that you don't owe me this money. So they're powerful. So you got to understand that's how they got Al Capone. So if you want to be a gangster, <laughs> if you really want to imitate that, we got to get on code. So if this goes to the streets, I want to say from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, brother, get on code. No children. No women. No elders. Man, get on code, man. Look at, go look at the Godfather. What did the man say when they were having that big meeting? He was talking about the powders. I had the powders. I got the powders. They, but they get 5,000, they can make 30, 40, 50,000. So I, I can't, so they, I can't, they can't resist. But I tell you, no children. It's not to be sold in schools. That's an infamia, he said, right? Then he goes on and then he goes on to say, sell it, put it in the dark ones. They ain't got a soul anyway. Keep it among the dark, right? Art imitating life or life imitating art. Hmm. Which one was that? Hmm. And then when you look at Scarface, he was supposed to he was supposed to kill he was supposed to kill the man that was coming that was the United Nations cat and they put a bomb underneath his car and he's with the guy in the car and he said and he sees the children and the wife get in the car and he, he says, No, 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 forget it. Mm -hmm. Forget it. No no wife, no kids. And the guy said, He said, Do it, man. He said, Do it. And he shot the cat in the head, man. He said, No, kids, no he yeah, was yeah. on code. And that's what ultimately got him killed. But he was on code. So what has happened? I go back to Brother Johnny Binder, but I go back to that war on drugs. You see, the streets have a military structure. The OGs, if you did some work, you put in some work, you had to explain why you did it or you were ordered to do it. But if you did it, you had to come and explain because, you know, violence is bad for business. When you swept up all the OGs off the street, you left the youngsters here wilding. Hmm. So they, there's really no rules out there. There used to be rules. There were certain things you did and did not do. So even some of the OGs are scared now because these young boys, they ain't, it's like. Psh. So that's what I was going to ask you because it's, it's a clear disconnection between like this younger generation of street cats and the older ones. Like, do you ever think or what's the strategy to do that because clearly it's, it's, it's bad out here i was just watching uh like i said i saw you on the news the other day i think it was when they were showing a segment with the guy who ran up on the lady at her house at the door like that's crazy you know what i mean yeah. well it, it boils down to this beloved it all comes down to knowledge of self this book message the black man other than the holy quran and bible <laughs> i recommend everybody get this that's book. on my read list i haven't read it yet but i've been wanting you to read you that. got to get this book, Message to the Black Man. Matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm just going. I'm going to give you. I'm going to lend you mine, then I'm come back and get it. But, <laughs> but Message to the Black Man, got to have message because it's our message. God would be a racist. He would go and he would raise up the Hebrew boys in Babylon. He would send. He would send angels to Lot and Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah. He would come to Noah and warn Noah. Noah <laughs> poor Noah. He preached for 150 years. He would send Moses to Pharaoh, Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh to warn Pharaoh to let my people go. He would raise up Jesus in the Roman Empire in Palestine. He would raise up Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Arabia. But he ain't going to send nobody for us? America is not in the Bible, Holy Quran. I'll let you film a debate between me and any imam, rabbi, priest, apostle, prophet, anybody they want to call themselves. United States of America is not in the Bible, the Holy Quran by name, but it's there. And if God, the all seeing, all knowing, wise and omnipresent God saw down the line of time, then he had to have seen America, the greatest political, economic, social, and military power that's on the planet in the last 6,000 years. Greater than Egypt, greater than Babylon, greater than Sodom and Gomorrah, greater than Rome, greater than the Ottoman Empire, greater than any nation that's ever been on this earth. God saw it, but he hid it under different names. And if God saw and he did, then he had to have seen us. 
There's no way we could have built this country, brother, through our slave labor or the land getting stolen from the Indians and God had not seen it. And if God is just, he has to raise a man for us to, to lead, teach, and guide us. So that's where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan come in, brother. This is why the papers call the final call. This is the final call. This generation is the greatest generation we ever produce. It's your generation, but it's the latter part of your generation. They are fearless. Our enemy knows it. Hillary Clinton called them super predators. Super predators. What was she saying? Hmm. See, they're fearless, brother, and they don't want to go to school because they don't want that kind of education, really brainwashing. They are, they are not going to follow the rules. They're hustlers because they can't spell entrepreneur. <laughs> it's just too big a word, but they're hustlers. They're not made to punch a clock. So no, they ain't going to McDonald's. They ain't going to Burger King. I know you wish they would, but they're not. You have to teach them entrepreneurship, but what they need most of all is the knowledge of self. Hmm. Once they know who they are and whose they are, and once they understand and realize that, my, that as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, every time I'm looking at the black man, I'm looking at God. So would I rob God? Would I murder God? Would I rape God in a female body? No. So you teach them the knowledge of self. Nation of Islam has a track record, pound for pound, brother, I put us up against anybody in reforming of human beings. Not everybody that comes in the nation comes out of prison, is on drugs and that kind of thing. We got people who are lawyers, doctors, and everything in the mosque. But we got everything from A to Z in the mosque. But it's a teaching that really has, has three, three elements, light, life, and power. Hmm. So, Brother Donnie, if you read Message of Black Man, or I ask everybody, come visit us at 44, 43 Old Spanish Trail. Come to the mosque 10 o'clock on a Sunday. It's like that club, you know, say, man, have you been to the so-and-so club? <laughs> you go, you gotta, gotta have that once-in-a-lifetime experience. And nobody told you you had to join. I'm gonna go. Just come go. to experience for yourself, hear what it is, and you'll be able to talk intelligently about it by your own experience. Instead of letting somebody else tell you or the media tell you who your leaders are, who what's good for you and what's not good for you. Brother, they know that these children, you ever watch them Steven Seagal movies? Oh, yeah. Like Above the Law, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. you know. And you notice that when he when he was fighting that Jamaican posse in that one movie, I don't know what time to die, or whatever that was called. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. And the cat was running at him in the in the jewelry store, and all he was doing was like a matador just and he wasn't moving. That's how they do in our youth. They know our youth are powerful and fearless, but as they come to them, they're using their own power and their own power and fearlessness against them to destroy themselves and destroy us. And so now even our own mothers and our grandmothers are going to be calling for the National Guard to come in. And I watched the CBS Evening News one day, brother. And they showed this task force, the FBI task force with the local police force. Man, they got military style vehicles, man, running up on people serving warrants or arresting people who have outstanding warrants. What we don't seem to understand is, is that since the murder of George Floyd, there's been uh, the police department has pulled back because they don't want to be on TV. They don't want to be in a lawsuit. They don't want to be. Uh, arrested, they don't want to lose their job and their pension. So they pulled back. So that's why there's an increase in crime. Don't let me tell you that all of a sudden we just start wilding out. Hmm. They just they just pulled back so that out of your fear, you would give up your liberty. We, we Save us. We got this white knight syndrome. Watch, mark my words, brother. We're being set up for somebody that's almost Donald Trump light to be mayor of this city. Because you got that black man, he ain't did nothing for us, but we might as well vote for this one here. Or we're going to stay home. Say, man, I ain't voting at all, man. And we're going to wind up putting in somebody like that. And they're going to come down on the streets. So my job is to appeal to them. Appeal to the streets. Get on code. To appeal to the rappers. To say to them, please, influence in a positive way. Talk about building the community. Keep it street. Report the news, but tell them that they got to change their way because there's a bigger fish. There's a shark out here. There's a killer shark out here that wants to eat all of us. You may think you're a mackerel and you may be eating minnows, hmm. but there's a killer shark that's coming to eat you. And if we recognize the fact of who we are, whose we are, 
and who our enemy is determine what must be done. We will recognize the fact, brother, that this nation is unraveling right in front of our eyes. And there's old saying, brother, only a fool fights in the burning house. Hmm. America's on fire right now. We 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 dying of smoke inhalation. I mean, we can we unconscious with smoke inhalation. So we have to we have to get focused on making our own neighborhoods safe and decent places to live. We cannot solve violent crime until we rebuild family and community life. That was what the Million Man March was about in 1995. And in fact, yesterday was the was the anniversary of 35,000 brothers coming to Pleasant Grove Missionary Baptist Church. They only held 15,000 at the call of Minister Farrakhan. This was in 1994. Man, they were all on the freeway. They were everywhere. But only 15,000 could get in. That meant 20,000 brothers wanted to get into something but couldn't. There wasn't one fight. One arrest, one car towed. Brother, there were perfect strangers who sat in cars outside the church and listened to the live broadcast. Man, it was peace. And it was a sign of what, what happened at the Million Man March. But what was the Million Man March was about? It was about black men atoning, being better fathers, better husbands, better brothers, brother sons, to work with our children, to work with our, 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 our uh, mothers, the, our wives, and in some cases to... to uh, those who gave birth to our children, but maybe we weren't married to them, to atone. It was a, a day of atonement for us to atone and to show the world that we weren't savage. Hmm. You had nearly two million men. And let me tell you something, man. When the enemy tells you, don't listen to that man Farrahan or Farrakhan. Don't listen to Farrakhan. He's a hater. He's a bigot. He's an anti-Semite. He, oh, he, 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 don't listen to him. <laughs> and then two million of us show up. Nearly two million like 1.8 million showed up. He can't even let you have that victory. Hmm. So he said only 400,000 was there. Man, please. Stevie Wonder, Stevie Wonder was there. He said, man, he, Stevie Wonder saw that there was a million, there was more than a million men out there. And they know it. We know by how many rides came from the Metro out of Maryland in there. We know how many buses that we parked at RFK Stadium. We know that there was more than a million men there, but they have to lie. Do you believe me or your lying eyes, hmm. they would say. Why? Because they told you not to come. And nearly, I think, uh, I don't know what the poll said. What was the poll, brother? Uh, was it like 85% of the men were Christian that came? Some 85% of the men that were there were Christian. So they went to work, man. They said, oh, we can't let this happen. Here's a man we don't control that called these brothers here and they came. And they didn't become Muslim. He didn't say, oh, y'all come and join the mosque. He said, go back to a church, join an organization, register to vote, go and do something in your community, reconcile with your family, never disrespect your woman, put on, uh, 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 listen to positive hip hop or, or never call your woman the B word or the H again, never do these things, never abuse children, never do violence unless in self-defense. And we took that pledge on that mall, brother. Now we have a lesson in the nation of Islam says, have you not learned that your word shall be bond regardless of whom or what? Hmm. And the answer is yes, my word is bond and bond is life and I'll give my life before my word shall fail. To the extent that we did not live up to that pledge. We gave birth to this generation and now this generation is, snap, is clapping back on us for what we didn't do. But much positive came out of the Million Man March. Much positive did come out of it. But they couldn't let the minister get that. That They'll name a park or alley or something after him, after him gone. This is the way they do. They hated Martin Luther King the last year of his life. They put a smoke bomb in the old Sam Houston Coliseum when he was here in 1967. He was supposed to speak here. They had Aretha Franklin, Joan Baez, uh, Harry Belafonte, all of them. And Dr. King was supposed to give a speech at the old Sam Houston Coliseum. And they put us the KKK put a smoke bomb in there, and they ran. And he said, "Well, I'll come back." He never came back. He was assassinated a year later. Wow! But it's why we love like William L Bill Lawson and, and others is because he was one of two or three preachers in the city that that embraced Dr. King. The rest of them said, "No, I don't want nothing to do with him because he stood up against the Vietnam War, and the white power struggle was ang angry with him." We cannot let people tell who. Who our, who, our, who our leaders are. We can't do that. We need to decide that for ourselves. So lastly, in, in terms of, of the question that you asked, brother, I want to I tell your viewing audience and you, 
You know, Nation of Islam not some charismatic character cult behind the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. When Mr. Farrakhan has his rendezvous with destiny, he leaves people behind. They're going to take care of the business. And so, at that particular point, they need to understand those who may be within, who are sent. See, some, you know, many are called and few are chosen. chosen yeah. But some are sent. <laughs> those who are sent send a message to you. And those without, don't try to gamble for Jesus' robes. See, we're on this Holy Week now, right? Jesus on the cross. They're crucifying the minister now in his, his good name. They're crucifying his good name. And there's cats down there right now shooting dice. They're casting lots, shooting dice for his robes. His robes is his followers. Hmm. Mr. Farrakhan's followers ain't all in the mosque. Mr. Farrakhan's followers is all over, brother. Here's an army you see and one you don't see. Hmm. And they already know, brother, that by what's going on, we got a different mindset. Our youngsters got a different mindset. Our women are giving birth to a different kind of child now that wants to be free. But they won't let us go. Either give us freedom, justice, and equality within the social, political, and economic order of America or let us go to build something for ourselves. But they won't do it. They won't even talk about reparations. And now they don't want a critical race theory. We're not going to teach. They don't teach critical race theory in elementary school. What they're saying is, but Donnie, they don't want to teach black history. Hmm. to the, their children because it make my little Johnny, little Mary might feel bad because you know what? The one sitting right there is the descendant of some enslaved Africans that built this country, the wealth of this country. And remember this, cotton was king after the Civil War. Hmm. Who picked that cotton? We yes, did. Yeah, yeah. So we, before oil and gas and anything else, the greatest export of America was cotton. We did that, and don't let everybody put it all on the South, neither. The Northern bankers, the Northern shipping companies, the Northern finance companies, the Northern insurance companies, all of them benefited from slavery. Brother, they were complicit in slavery. There were those in the North that didn't want the Civil War to take place because they was getting paid. This whole thing, brother, has been a conspiracy against us. We fought, bled, and died in every war that they've had, man. We were the first to die in the Revolutionary War. Christopher Saddix was the first to die. 5,000 blacks fought in the Revolutionary War on the side of the, uh, of the Americans, the rebels, and they fought with the British too because they promised them freedom. We fought in the Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraqi freedom, Desert Storm, Afghanistan. We've given our blood, sweat, and tears to this nation. Yet, did you see how they treated that sister when she was going to be on the Supreme Court? Man, oh, man I don't terrible. know about you, but I yeah. wanted to reach through the TV, man, and snatch these boys up. That yeah, was terrible. It was terrible yeah. how they did And she was more qualified than everybody that's on the court right now. And it was crazy. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're qualified, but no. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but, but no, what? No. See, so, brother, you know, so I, I'm just saying, I didn't mean to get so because, you know, some of your shows is real lighthearted and whatnot. <laughs> I, I, we started off lighthearted, but, but it really gets down to the point where I really am asking those who view your show, those who love hip-hop, those who consume hip-hop, those who produce hip-hop, get free. Get knowledge, get truth, get organized, get free. You don't need the Grammys. You don't need the Oscars. You don't need the Tony Awards. You got enough talent, skill among yourself and money that you could do what Jay Prince talked about when they did they were gonna ban Kanye from, from the Grammys performing. Let's go and let's do something. Let's go and do something for, for ourselves. That's the kind of mindset we should have. That Master P mindset we should have. I went out with uh to um the uh the funeral and the memorial service at the Staples Center of Nipsey Hussle was out there. And I just think about those people. I think about Young Dolph in Memphis. What killed them? Envy. People envious. So we gotta get envy out of our hearts. And Minister Farrakhan teaches us to get envy out your heart. The only way you can, you can, you can uh, get envy out your hearts is with the love of God. Hmm. Because what you see in other people, 
the talent and skill you see in other people, the God that you are in this podcast, brother, I admire. I bow down to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thank no, brother. Reno, what's up, Reno? Brother, you, you bring out of them people. I'm watching it, and I'm learning so much. You my teacher when it comes to, to this city and the hip-hop. You're my teacher. And so I always, as Minister Farrakhan, trying to follow the way of my, my, my leader, I say, Brother Donnie, it's kind of like this, man. I always meet somebody that's greater than me. Hmm. So whatever you admire me, I admire it in you. And if I admire that in you, and you admire it in me, then you see God in me and I see God in you. So how can I rob, steal, and murder from you if that's what I see? I see a reflection of God. There's Donnie Houston, there's Aline, Halim Muhammad, but this is just the flesh veil of it all. So we have to be very careful, man, about what we can do. So look at our community. Open your eyes and look at the community, y'all. Why is it that we don't have any grocery stores? Did you know, brother, that out of the people that died in this city, 50% of those, according to the Houston Health Department, 50% of those had diabetes. Oh, wow. And that 13.5% of the 2.3 million people, like about 311,000 people in this city, have diabetes. So why didn't we declare diabetes as a health crisis since 50% of the people died from it? And what does it come from? It comes from this diet. So now here we are, man. We're going to Burger Killer. I hope they ain't one of your sponsors. <laughs> nah, brother. nah, nah. They ain't never gonna be now, but it's fine. Go ahead. Nick Devil, <laughs> Nick Devil, Death in the Box, you know, crutches, fried chicken. We ain't gonna Kentucky, have no fast food. Kentucky <laughs> fried cancer. Ahead, you you, you can cancer. forget that. But if you look, brother, where's our grocery stores? Where's our fresh fruits and vegetables? Yeah. So now we're eating this processed food. And then if you go in certain places, man, I don't know, you know, you can find it, but if you want to find a Final Call newspaper, go on OST and Scott. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. And you can always be a Final Call newspaper. The brother's out there hitting the paper. But here's the thing, brother. Here's the thing. Across the street from CVS is a Walgreens. But, and up there, I call it death row. All of these fast food spots, all up there. But where's a real grocery store? There's a small one, all these. And pie burns like down Scott across from South Lawn. H-E-B, a big H-E-B, but they moved they the H-E-B moved that was there at Scott OST. They moved it over there closer to the medical center. Come on, man. So I, if, I never even put that together like that. I'm an urban planner. Yeah. And when you read those books, the, those books in there, they kind of interviewed me about that. See, our greatest threat to our communities is not light rail or eminent domain or highway construction our greatest threat is tax foreclosures hmm. the first monday i think a tuesday of every month they're down there at the harris county courthouse man auctioning and buying our properties so when you look on the rolls of who owns the property in our community you're going to see names that don't belong to us and they sit on that property until its highest and best use is realized. And then, because our city has no zoning, we have no land zoning, so we're governed by Chapter 42 of the city code. And what happens is, Brother Donnie, is, is a, we got deed restrictions. So if in your subdivision, if in Crestmont or, or South Park or Sunnyside or wherever Third Ward, if your little subdivision, foster place, doesn't keep up its deed restrictions, they're unenforced, unenforceable, then I go down there and I buy a tax foreclosed property. I'm next to Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones got a shotgun shack or a ranch house. I sit on that lot. I buy another one. Then I go down to the planning department and I subdivide the lot was not just a single family anymore, which it was deed restricted before. Now it's not that anymore. I go down and I go down to the planning commission and I get a variance so I can subdivide that lot. I subdivide that lot and here's Mrs. Jones's house. Her and her family has grown up there all the time. She's older now. She, she, she has a senior citizen exemption, but her children live in Pearland, Sugarland, Mo City, wherever, this, that, and the other. And they really don't want that house. I, ain't, I don't want that house, Mama. I got my own. Not thinking 
how valuable that house is. So what happens is, is that these people who have bought that property, they subdivide the lot. And next thing you know, brother, they put it, you'll see those white signs that say variance. They'll come to subdivide that lot, and next thing you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six townhouses. All right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Each one, $300,000. So now the tax value goes up. Can't nobody afford to live there. And then you can't afford to live there. And next thing you know, you're crying about gentrification. But again, this man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad Amin Lewis Farrakhan said, get some of this earth you can call your own. Hmm. So when I see Slim Thug, when I see Trey, when I see others doing stuff like that, man, Jay Prince and others, man, in business, entrepreneurship, <laughs> Jay is like this, you know, if it don't make sense, if it don't make sense, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. That's my man. I mean, he's, he's, he's perfectly honest, you know. But the bottom line is if you don't own nothing, man, you can't do, you can't have a Jay Prince uh, uh, basketball court or community center or boxing ring if you don't own that dirt. So we got to earn, we got to own where we live. Ownership is key in this country. If you don't own nothing, man, that's how they treat you. They dismiss you. Dismiss. It's like Orange Juice Jones and walking in the rain. And then <laughs> yeah. you, you dismiss. You dismiss. Yeah. You, dismiss. <laughs> you know, we get dismissed like that. So that when you look at the conditions of our community, we can connect it like this. When you see the conditions of our community, you see the, the state of our schools, you see the state of no grocery stores, when you see the disparity in health care, when you see the unemployment numbers, when you see all of that and you put that all together, you see that our community is in crisis. And so that must be addressed. And it has to be addressed by us. It starts with us. So. Yeah. Well, man, uh, man, this has been amazing. You know what I mean? This has been really enlightening, like, just on so many levels, man. Like, I'm, like I said, it was an honor to even have you come and then to sit here and have you be a part of the show, man. I'm, I'm extremely thankful and extremely honored. You know what I mean? K. Reno came in. You know, he connected us, like I said earlier. Uh, so it's an honor to have the GOAT in the building as well. You know what I'm saying? But, um, man, it's, it's been a so real we, honor. So we do the work. We're putting in the work, brother. We're trying yeah. to do, you know, peace rides. Uh, we've done peace rides. We're gonna have a peace ride this Sunday. I don't know when this is gonna air. When is it gonna air? Uh, it's probably like two weeks. Two weeks? Probably. Okay. Well, you know, but we do things like you know peace rides and whatnot to try to stem the violence and bring together those elements that make up the modern hip hop. Is, Slab is, cars. Is there a regular like a regularity with it? Like okay, because well, Houston is so hot, mm -hmm. we can't do it like in California. They got 75 degrees all year long. You, you know, Houston got two seasons, summer and August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we're doing what we can. But we're going to do one this, this weekend coming up. We're going to do one this Sunday. And it'll wind up at the, uh, at the fairgrounds. We're going to do an Independence Heights uh, there and uh, fairgrounds. So we'll do a peace ride. And then there'll be a gathering uh, where, uh, where Yandy Productions does. does he's his 14th annual. This is his 14th annual thing. So, so we have the well, piece right egg hunt, what I have right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So we got the what the four, yeah, 14 annual Spring Fest 2002 car and bike show. It's the Easter egg hunt. Jaime Sinatra, Miss Cliche, K Reno of the, of the SPC, Lil Steve of the Zydeco uh, Futures. Man, DJ Tricky C, he's in here as well. What's up, boy? Um, man, there's a lot going on. It's a family event. So, yeah. So, if you can get that in, I don't know before Easter egg hunt for the kids, it'll be yeah, over this, yeah. this weekend, but. Whatever, I, I just wanted to, first, lastly, I'll close Brother Donnie by thanking you for allowing me to come over the People's Sacred Airwaves, for giving me an opportunity to speak to your audience, uh, the audience that tunes into your program. Again, you're my teacher when it comes to this, and everyone that sits at this couch is, but I have to do my job, which is to say to them, to whom much is given, much is to be required. Mm -hmm. And when you have great talent and influence, you're going to be held accountable for how you use it. So use it right so that when you look back and you have your grandchildren riding in the car with you, you can play your own music. Hmm. <laughs> or at least your own. <laughs> yeah, your own music, at least the radio version, <laughs> or at least some of those other songs that are on your album that may not have been the hits, yeah. but yet they were on the album as a statement of how you felt how you felt about love, how you felt about family, how you felt about community, how you felt about the political world, what's going on, how you felt about the war in Ukraine, why all this coverage? 
but yet no coverage about what's going on in Yemen or Somalia or Ethiopia or in the Congo where there's been a war going on since Mobutu fell when the Zaire disintegrated and there's been millions of people killed. But why this kind of emphasis? And what are, what are those drum beats leading us to? Hmm. And to my brothers who were in college, if you applied for financial aid, you had to sign up for the Selective Service Act. If they reinstitute the draft, you got a decision to make. Hmm. Are you going to be like Muhammad Ali? Or are you going to go into the service? My warning is, though, this man that's over there now, Putin, they're backing him in a corner. And desperate people do desperate things. And we may go over there by the hundreds of thousands and come back by the dozens. So think very carefully about that. Peace is the answer. Love is the answer. We've got a no war, no war, N-O war, <laughs> no peace. Hmm. K-N-O-W, peace. Yeah. No war, no peace. So I thank you, brother, and, and I pray that God blesses you. And please give your family the greetings and all your fans. I say thank you for letting me be on the Donnie Houston show. Well, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. For sure. Well, this has definitely been an honor for me. Uh, listen, I hope everybody, after you watch this, you want to go own something. You know what I mean? Uh, whether it's some land, whether it's your music, whatever. You know what I mean? But you need to get a piece of this, man. Let's not just continue to do things that that uh, benefit others. You know what I'm saying? After after works of our backs and all that you know what i'm saying that's really what i'm walking away with one of the main things i'm walking away with man is that ownership man um but again i can't wait to get in the mess of the black man this has been a real honor for me dr halim abdul muhammad extremely honored man it's down East podcast appreciate y'all oh before we get up out of here make sure you hit that button subscribe turn the alerts on all that uh check out Danny houston world we got the hats on the site right now and um yeah we out of here man Donnie Houston. Subscribe to the Donnie Houston Podcast, man.